Hi, and welcome to our Sears 2.0. I'm super excited to uh, bring some of my favorite Sears, and I know some of your favorite Sears, um, to talk about a little bit about their journey. They may share a little bit about what they feel like God's showing them. Um, so what it helps you do, as we love equipping people, what it makes you do is to maybe process some of the visions, maybe some of the dreams that God's given you during this time, to watch how they process what God's saying. And so I think that I, that helps me. So I feel like that's going to help you also. So I wanted, I have, I mean, I just feel like this is just like, we have gold here today, right? We have Jane Hammond, who is like one of my favorite in the whole wide world. Um, we have James Gall. We have Jennifer Eva. We have Jamie Galloway, um, we have Brian Gurin, and so I'm super, ex super excited to have them. And I just want to give a little shout out to Jane Hammond before we have her on here. Um, God has used her in my life for 20 something years. She's a hero to me. Um, you know, it's kind of funny. I knew of her, but she didn't know of me. And so for every throughout, like there would be every time I had these landmark seasons in my life, I would run into her and uh, she would give me a word about uh, whatever season I was about to enter in and God would, you know, whether I was going one way, it would stop and pivot me into the God moment. And so I want to give her a little bit of a shout out. Um, even starting internationally Young Prophets, we started it because she gave me a word about starting it. And so uh, it's amazing to see what God's doing in the earth and how powerful he's used her. I have the highest respect for her. I mean, if she gives you a word, you can take it to the bank. So um, we want to welcome Jane Hammond to share. It. Apostle Jane, what I love about you is I love that you're so practical, you're a pastor, you help people so much. And, um, you know, just you're so good about taking like your dreams and visions book is so practical. It's probably one of the most practical dreams and vision books I've ever read. It makes, it's such a connect for people's hearts, but like maybe share a little bit. I, I don't know that I fully ever heard fully your journey, how God really started to speak to you. And you knew like, man, I'm having visions, I'm having dreams and what can, what, how does God use and connect all of that, how to get working with that? <laughs> well, thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you for all those, those wonderful words that, that you just shared. Um, you know, my journey uh, began prophetically about a month after I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I heard the audible voice of God, and uh, that was my first encounter with knowing that God had spoken to me. And basically, I'm still living out the word that God spoke to me when I was 16 years old. But not too long after that, I went off to Bible college and... Uh, began to live this spirit-filled journey and I began to have prophetic dreams that I would see something in a dream and then I would get up and I would pray, I would intercede and the dream would happen, but it would happen without the disastrous outcome that I had seen happen in the dream. So this happened multiple times and kind of got my attention um, regarding that God was actually speaking to me. I went to the word and I found that there's over 50 occurrences in scripture where God spoke to somebody through a dream or a vision. And up, up to that point in the late 70s, early 80s, I had not heard anybody say anything about God speaking in a dream or a vision. And so, of course, my whole foundational scripture was really Acts chapter 2, and I began to understand that God wants to speak through prophecy, which is hearing what God says and saying what God says, but then he also wants to speak um, in the language of seers, which is dreams and visions as well. And this is not just for prophets. This is not just for people that are called to the fivefold ministry gift of a prophet. But really, this is also for those that, um, that are filled with the Holy Spirit. Because it says, in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. And so these are the manifestations of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. Now, not too long after that, I married into the Hammond family, and uh, uh, Bishop Hammond is uh, actually known as the father of the modern prophetic movement, and so I got to be a part of that whole birthing season of birthing the prophetic voice and training people, equipping people to hear the voice of God, and Bishop Hammond is more of a, what we call a Nabi prophet. There's different words that are translated prophet. One is Nabi, which has a base word that means to bubble up, so in other words, we were trained, you lay hands on somebody and the word of the Lord bubbles up inside of you. You don't see anything necessarily, you open your mouth and you let it flow. So I was a seer prophet trained by a Nabi prophet. Um, and, and so as 
bubbling up was occurring as the Nabi prophetic anointing was occurring, the Roe or the Chose, which are the, the words for seer, um, actually was operating. So as it would bubble, I would start seeing pictures, I would start seeing visions, I would begin to take those things that I was seeing and then translate them into the, the, the Nabi prophetic flow. Um, God has always spoken to me through dreams. God continues to speak to me through dreams and visions. Um, I'm, I'm actually very um, visual in how the Lord speaks to me. And God will give me prophetic dreams that will uncover things that are happening in nations. Uh, God will give me visions in times of worship or times of seeking the Lord. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the, you know, we'll, we'll get to this later, but the, the whole time that we're in right now, the Lord gave me some visions about earlier this year. And I just believe that it's time for the entire body of Christ to be equipped to both hear the voice of God as he speaks to them personally, but also to understand that it's, it's, it's not necessarily necessary to get spooky spiritual or fall into a trance. I mean, that's, that's a biblical thing too, but you don't have to fall into a trance or go into another realm to actually receive pictures or visions or revelation from the Lord. I just want to just close this part by just saying that I love the word revelation because in the Greek, it's the word apokalupsis. And apokalupsis, apo means to take away and calypsis means the curtain or the veil. And so what we're doing when we're seeing into the realm of the spirit is that we are removing the curtain or the veil that obscures our vision from being able to clearly see or clearly hear things. And so I, my heart and my passion is to see people equipped to hear the voice of the Lord, whether they're hearers, whether they're seers, whether they're feelers or sensors, God speaks in a, in a variety of ways. And when I train seers, I talk to them about seeing in the spirit, I talk to them about learning how to wait on the Lord, get in his presence and wait patiently for the Lord and keep looking. God may give you a vision, but you need to keep looking and, and see if the vision's over. Keep looking, keep looking until God speaks everything and shows you everything that it is that he wants you to see. So whether it's through a dream of the night or a vision during times of the presence of the Lord or times even that God might catch you unaware, uh, God is looking for ways to speak and communicate to his people. And these are some of the different ways. And I love training people in all of them. Yeah. Apostle Jane, I love that. I actually, while you were saying that, I was thinking about the watchman prophet. Do you have yeah. like a, mi a minute or two that you can share really quick? Cause I feel like there are going to be people watching yeah. and they really need to know what the watchman prophet is in the season. So that's actually the fourth dimension of the prophetic that I, that I teach on when I teach on the seer gift, and it's the Shamar prophet, which is translated as the watchman. And I am a watchman, so a lot of times what I am actually seeing is I'm either seeing angelic strategies, demonic strategies, uh, like Elisha saw into the realm of the spirit and was able to see what was transpiring in the realm of the spirit. I think that there's probably a lot of seer watchman prophets that are gaining revelation so that we understand how we can properly position ourselves to bring heaven into the earth realm. Uh, to, Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But if we're not understanding what's happening in the heavenlies, um, both from the angelic armies, as well as in the second heavens from demonic strongholds and demonic strategies, uh, spiritual assignments, uh, God brought me up in all of that. And I can remember the first time Bishop Hammond asked me to identify a spiritual stronghold. Um, he basically said, you know, this is what I want you to do. Go in behind the veil you know, you know, seek the Lord and, and, and God will show you. And, and uh, it sounded so spooky spiritual. And I was like, I have no idea what any of that means. And basically I just began to pray in the spirit. I actually had six children in the car and they were back in the back being crazy. And I'm praying in tongues. And all of a sudden I could see the name of the spiritual stronghold. And when I went and looked it up phonetically in Hebrew, it was exactly what we had talked about that morning, the exact characteristics of the demonic spirit. So in that particular case, I actually saw the name spelled out and then was able to take it and develop, devise a spiritual strategy that we were able to use to take it down. So there's, there's a lot of different ways that God will use the watchman anointing through the seer gift um, to be able to alert us to both the enemy's plans, but also alert us to with the activity of angel armies so that we can know how to properly align with them. 
Wow. Wow. I love that. And so I love like how, how, how Apostle Jane rolls. I love that. I love how God has put her together and really equips people for that. So let's welcome James Gall. James is just, I just look up to James in so many ways. And so I so appreciate him breaking open the seer realm a lot with, I think his book, I mean, I don't know how many copies you've sold to your book, The Seer, James, but that was like a game changer for me because I didn't know what was going on in my life until I read your book. And then I was like, I'm normal. I, I think I'm normal. But um, so welcome, James Gall. Hey, thank you, Elizabeth, and this wonderful company of people. And uh, yeah, good. So we all have our similar trails and we each have our unique um, manner in which the Lord develops us. So I grew up in rural Missouri, but I grew up as a prayer child. So I had a relationship with the Lord as a child where I talked to God and God talked back, and I thought that was normal Christianity, and I still think it is. And then along the way, then when, just like Jane, when I got then filled or baptized in the Holy Spirit, before I ever spoke in tongues, I started to prophesy. And before I ever prophesied, I started having what I called mental snapshot pictures. This is all the way back to 1972. There was no teaching that I knew of in this area at all. But it's what happened with me. It was an overflow, and it was visions and prophesying. So for 10 straight years, because my call is Jane and I are wired in some ways with a lot of similarity, because there's the teacher, we get something by revelation, and then we go wordsmith it, we dig it out. I, that's what I do. And I dig it out in Jewish and church history, as well as in the Word of God. And you might hear it, you might see it. I will tend to see it. Then I, I'll feel it in worship. I will see it. And then I go research it. And I pray into it. But, so for 10 straight years, I prayed for the school of the prophets to come forth. For 10 straight years, virtually every day. I did not really know what I was praying into. I'm 20 years old. When I turned 30, there was this young man named Mike Bickle who called forth for a 21-day Joel's Army fast. I was pastoring at that time. I gave myself with our church to 21 days of worship, prayer, and fasting, and that was when I met a collegiality of the beginning of seer prophets, namely, in specific, Bob Jones. That led me eventually, not long after, to move to Kansas City and became a part, just like CI has been uh, a primary place of the emergence of the Naba prophets in 1988. So Kansas City at that time was an emerging hub for the seer prophets. And so it's two distinct streams. So I had attached myself with Mike Bickle, Bob Jones, Paul Kane, and John Paul Jackson, and I was one of the only seven that was recognized in that period of time in a cross-pollination with the Vineyard Movement with John Wimber. So I was one of the seven that was recognized by John Wimber as a seer prophet, and then I emerged. I want to touch something biblically. And Jane mentioned, keep looking, keep on seeing. Because what I wanted to bring you from the Word is from Daniel 7. This is my model. My model comes from Daniel 7. Some people, when they see, they stop. They don't keep looking. Some people, in particular, when they see evil, they stop. They make a series out of it. They write a book on it. They become the next faint whatever, okay? that I want to keep looking past the revival of evil and keep looking because darkness is only the backdrop for light to shine. And in Daniel 7, verse 15, it says that he kept looking. In verse 19, it says uh, that uh, I desired to know, and so I kept on looking. 
And then verse 21, I kept on looking. And then, uh, and then it just keeps going on. I kept on looking until I saw the ancient of days. I want to exhort the people out there. You might see something. Keep on looking. Keep on looking, not just for the problem. It doesn't take a prophet seer to see a problem. But we will see problems. We will see hindrances. We will see warfare. But I want to exhort us, and this is my, my learning pattern. Keep on looking for the solution and the God of the solution. Wow. Wow. I love that, James. Um, and so appreciate you. So I want to welcome Jennifer Evez. I love Jennifer Evez. We're actually doing a conference next week in Savannah together. And so uh, Jennifer, what I love about her is she's so pastoral. She's super protective over people she's raising up and, you know, her church. And she's just so protective over the body. And so also is this fiery prophet. And so, so I appreciate you so much, Jennifer. So welcome Jennifer Evez. And she shares a little bit about how God started to talk to her and her journey. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I just love what you're doing. And just a big shout to, to Jane and James. Um, I just respect them so much. I've read uh, most of their books. And so for my journey, um, I didn't become a Christian until I was a freshman in college, but I always saw. I was always able to see into the spiritual realm. And of course, that was connected to an occultic background, uh, many layers of that. And so coming into Christianity, it wasn't a big deal for me to see something. It was just a question of, you know, what are we going to do with this now? Because I was still um, very connected uh, demonically. You know, when you just get saved, there's still that connectivity. That's, that's the only connection, you know, and God was trying to radically change me into his realm and see his, see what he has seen and say what he is saying. And so uh, for a period of time, he began to train me himself because we didn't have the books. We didn't have the teachers. We didn't have those, those uh, resources. And so he took it upon himself to train me personally and began to ask me things like this. What do you see? You know, uh, and he would highlight somebody or a situation and he would ask me the question, what do you see he did not mean naturally he meant spiritually and I would begin to voice back to him what I saw spiritually um, and then uh, you know so we went back and forth on that for a period of time and then he he um, you know he added to that question he would say what do you see and I would respond and then he would say what do you know and of course it wasn't uh, in regards to what I knew naturally but what I knew spiritually hypothetically uh, for example this is not a real example I would see somebody I knew at the grocery store um, and he would point them out and say, what do you see? And I would say, well, I see a black cloud over Bob's head. And the Holy Spirit would say, what do you know? And I said, hmm, it feels like he just lost his job. And then I would go to my prayer place and I would pray Bob through the situation, not even thinking or knowing for sure if it was real or not. But time began to reveal that what I was seeing, what I was knowing was real. And then secondly, I, I finally discovered in the Bible, that's how he trained Amos. That's how he talked to Jeremiah. What do you see? And we have the, the very same dialogues. And so for me, um, because I had also simultaneously and seen in the spiritual realm, you know, it fits with, within this, this vein, is I had a very strong discerning of, of spirit's gifts. So uh, I didn't just discern, I discerned microscopically. I mean, I went all the way, you know, to the roots and the roots of the roots of the roots of the roots, you know. And so um, with that, um, and this is my hallmark message, um, because that kind of level of anointing, which nobody at the time was talking about, there were no books, you know, I wrote the book, Seeing the Supernatural, and now I, Jane has a book, um, James has a book, and I'm sure others are coming that are, that are amazing. Um, and so what was happening, it was making me crazy. I couldn't, I couldn't carry that anointing. It was overwhelming it, it, because it, it works through your emotions. It works through your feelings. You're not sure what's you. You're not sure what's, what is what. And I discovered so many things I was feeling were not me. It was God's voice. And I need to learn to sort it. I need to learn to be purposeful. I needed to learn uh, what was, what it, eventually things became white noise once I got that sorted out. Um, and I could focus on what he was, what he was showing me and actually begin to pray it through. Like Jane said, be that Shamar prophetic watchman, uh, communicate what he's saying, make it plain, uh, Habakkuk 2, and uh, the, shouting the message to people like me, you're not crazy, you have a gift, the Lord wants to help you walk this out. 
Yeah. Yeah. I love that, Jennifer. I know I was, I shared on the last broadcast we did for the seer about when I, when God opened my, I mean, I've seen my whole life. Um, just like as some of you are watching online, I used to get attacked in the night when I was younger. And then as I got older and, you know, I became, I got to, you know, when I was 14 years old, I became, I got to know the Lord and so got saved. And so with that, after that, I was in the middle of a revival. Well, you think your seer gift, your seer gift is like crazy in revival because you're seeing angels, you're seeing all these stuff. And I, in the last broadcast, and I think this will help go into Brian Gurn because some of you are watching, you're like, am I crazy? Like all the stuff I see. And I remember in revival, I would see so much. It would wear me out and just, it overwhelmed my senses because I was learning. I didn't know I was learning to grow at that time. And I just asked the Lord to shut down that gift. I said, take it away. I don't want this gift. I don't want to see. I just want to enjoy a revival. And so when he took it away, I felt like part of me was taken away. And so then I had to go back and repent to the Lord and ask him to give me back that gift so I could see again. And I could, and I would learn how to grow in that gift. So that was really encouraging. And so with Brian Gurn, I just love Brian. We went to Bible school together. We've known each other a long time. I have a lot of respect for him. And um, one of the things I wanted Brian to share on his journey, as some of you guys are learning how to operate and how to go deeper in your seer gifting, um, I love when Brian, I don't know what part of your journey, Brian, maybe you can share this part, but um, when you were asking the Lord, like how God called you, you're going to talk about the Eagle and driving from Houston to Dallas. So welcome, Brian Gurn. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Elizabeth. Uh, super honored to be with you all on here. And yeah, I mean, real quickly, it's funny you say that because often when I'm in a company of, you know, seers like you all, I feel like the black sheep, to be honest with you, because the way I entered into it was so backwards for me, at least. And as you well know, I, I got born again in 98 at the age of 20 and immediately got thrust over into the Brownsville Revival in Pensacola. And so... That was what I cut my teeth on right out of the gate. You've got like an evangelist before you. Uh, I'm in the school of ministry. They're telling us about John G. Lake, Smith Wigglesworth, which I still devour and love and adhere to today. All of that miracles, evangelism. So the prophetic was nowhere in my grid at all. I didn't have any dreams I never saw. That's what I love about you guys. I, I didn't really have that. And all I know is right after Bible college, fast forward to like two, 2004, I became really, really hungry to encounter God in a fresh way. And I didn't know what it was. I could just sense it was close. So I kind of amped things up a little bit through pursuit and fasting and just loving Jesus. And I honestly thought, this is late 04, that some Wigglesworth man was going to fall out of the sky. You know what I mean? I'm going to go shake the nations and see power and miracles. And we, we do all that. It's fun. But I went to a conference that you mentioned in Dallas actually, some, some well reputable known ministers and, and anointed and prophetic and all this. They were laying hands on people, and I thought I could feel it was just this encounter with God was going to happen. I thought it would happen in the meetings. Bodies are flying everywhere, and I don't have a goosebump. Nothing happened. <laughs> you know, like, wow. So I finally leave the last day, and the Lord tricked me, as unique as this experience sounds. And I love that Jane mentioned, you know, it doesn't always have to be the super mystical. I love the practical. It just um, I can so relate because I'm bent that way. I'm very logical at times. And, so I'm just simply driving from Dallas back to Houston, as you mentioned. And all I know, I can still see it to this day, is this falcon of some form. Mind you, I'm wanting John G. Lake, you know, all this. I don't know, in, have, don't have any dreams up to this point. I'm now like 20-something years old, no visions, pictures. I don't get that world. And a falcon, this is the best way I can describe it, swoops out of the sky. I'm going about 75 miles per hour on the interstate and spreads its wings and covers my whole windshield. I'm in a full-size SUV and stares me in my eyes, just pierces my eyes with his eyes. I wish I could have said it was like, yeah, this is amazing. The Lord's doing something, but I was scared. I swerved off the road to miss it, swerved back on. And I was like, what was, it was just had that, that spiritual connection to it where it just wasn't by accident. I don't know if you guys ever had that type of stuff where just like that, that would felt set up. And uh, so that was, I was beginning to pray. And before I knew it, within a night or two, I start going into these very vivid, crystal clear dreams. I'd foresee the future. I'd be in prayer. Pictures would happen. So something, again, I don't all have it figured out with that experience of seeing in the eyes was deposited. And uh, I immediately, actually, James Gall's book, The Seer, rocked me to the core. I would really encourage whoever's listening to this to get that. That was one of the first books, actually grabbed because I didn't know where to go and how to learn and hone in on this. And, 
And so since then, it's been a journey and been just really um, a joy, actually, you know, to step into it further and grow and, and, uh, and learn. So, yeah. Yeah, I love it. So how would you encourage maybe uh, just for a minute or two, encourage people like that have experiences to maybe take from that and start developing their gift? Yeah, I and mean, I'm sure many of you guys will expound in, in an even greater way. But for me, that's what I did. I, I, as they said, I began to study it out and always try to. I was thankful for that in Bible college. As you well know, we were given a solid biblical foundation. Everything must match up with the word, not, not contradict scripture. And so I do my best to always find it through the word and also glean from generals and fathers and mothers in the faith like, like you all. And, and I, I, for me personally, I start to journal and just pray. I wouldn't always share everything I saw, you know, um, but just watch and, and uh, begin to look more and see. And all of a sudden things would start to come to pass that I'd already seen. And I would just learn, oh, um, I love that Jane mentioned dreams. Sometimes I would learn they seem so real and more disastrous than they could have been. And then they got changed through prayer and it didn't have to be literal. And I began to watch all of this and learn. And it really, uh, and, I, and I'm still learning today, but you have to encourage people. Stewardship is really big. First Corinthians 4, Paul says we're to steward the mysteries of Christ. You see over and over in, in scripture, Daniel said, this is the dream I had, O king, and this is its record. Advocate 2, write down plainly up on tablets. So stewarding, staying in the word, you know, and, and uh, surrounding yourself with like people in, in the similar anointings. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Brian is so powerful. He does so many teachings and trainings all the time. And so we want to welcome Jamie Galloway. I love Jamie. I think I've done more broadcasts with Jamie than anybody else on this planet. <laughs> so Jamie, I love working with Jamie. And uh, Jamie, I believe, is going to be one of those guys that is going to be just be one of known as a seer in our generation, like one of the great seers in our generation. And so, um, Jamie, if you could just share a little bit about your journey and how God spoke to you uh, on, on becoming a seer. Well, Elizabeth, I want to thank you. You know, we've done so much together this year and uh, you're the real deal. And so it's really encouraging to work with someone like you. So, you know, for me, uh, the seer thing started really young. I mean, when I was, I can remember dreams back when I was three four years old. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, and I'm not joking. I, I re really can remember that far back. And so having dreams, it was a very significant part of my life and um, growing up. And I saw both heavenly things and also uh, demonic things. And so those things really kind of, uh, you know, shaped my childhood. Now, when I really came to know the Lord, and I'm, I'm talking about full submission and I just said, yes, I give up Jesus. You're the king of my life. That's when everything really became heightened. And I started seeing on a whole nother level. And so dreams and visions became a very big part of uh, that experience. But one of the things that I think is a takeaway, there was a man that I was around who had quite an unusual level of seer encounters. And I said, hey, would you do me a favor and lay hands on me. And so when, when I asked him to lay hands on me, something happened at that time. And I was probably 17 years old. Uh, he laid hands on me. And this guy, he was a big deal. I mean, he got saved. He was actually formerly a cult leader, uh, had his own massive following, fe uh, fell actually in love with Jesus, left the cult, left all of that, repented, got saved. And the way he got saved was he actually with his cult in a bus, a big bus, I'm talking about a big school bus that they converted to travel all over the U.S. They ran into Mike Bickle's IHOP. They actually physically ran into that, and uh, Mike Bickle and his crew came out to see what, what, what the hubbub was, and they ended up leading him to the Lord. It was pretty remarkable. The guy goes on to really become a, uh, just a profound seer, and, and he was on the cover of Charisma magazine years ago. So, he laid hands on me, and when he laid hands on me, all of a sudden, I began to see flashes of light all around, and I didn't even know what I was seeing. It was like I was being blinded by all these flashes of light, and colors, and flashes of light, and shapes, and I couldn't even make out what was going on, and so within the following week, I remember I went to a meeting, and it was this uh, meeting at a university, Washington University and, and so I remember it in St. Louis at Washington University. It was a Christian worship gathering, and it was an acoustic set, Elizabeth. I mean, it was really, really remarkable. It was an acoustic set, 
And these guys were just going for it up on the stage. No, no, nothing digital, no electronic, nothing, all acoustic. They're going for it. They're worshiping. Everybody's worshiping. And all of a sudden I look up and I see this guy as he's just going, we just need to praise Jesus. We just need to praise Jesus. And I think, oh my goodness, the special effects here are incredible. And, and, and he's just going, praise Jesus, guys, just praise Jesus. And I lean over to my friend. I said, the special effects here are incredible. I don't know how they're doing this with the acoustic set, but they're making rainbows shoot off that guy's arms. And he says, what are you talking about? And I said, the rainbows coming off of him. I don't know how they're doing that, but this is an amazing, you know, the, the, the technology is incredible. And he said, there are no rainbows shooting off that guy's arms. I don't know what you're talking about. And I was going, no, the rainbows shooting off of his arms and his shoulders, it's just amazing. It's like flying all over the room. How are they doing this? I really, I was convinced it was some kind of trick, but it wasn't. It was, I was seeing in the spirit. I was seeing the glory of God in the multicolored, multifaceted expression, like the rainbow around the throne. And so that really just got me, my interest peaked. I was like, whoa, I want to, what is this? And so from then on, I started going on this amazing journey, really thinking, wow, God's being very intentional about this. And I find that for me, what is a takeaway in my story and a takeaway in many others is there's a blindness that, that God wants to bring us out of. And through the laying on of hands and being close in proximity to those that can see, something begins to awaken in you, the ability to see. I'm reminded of the man that Jesus led out of the town, and he, and he prays for him. He's, he's actually blind physically, but Jesus prays for him. It, it's in Mark chapter 8, and it's where Jesus leads him out of the town of Bethsaida. He prays for him, and the man says, I see men like trees walking. And Jesus prays for him again, and then his eyes were completely restored. Well, the first time that he prayed for him, Jesus actually heals him of his spiritual blindness. And the, the way I get to that is how does a blind man know what trees look like? How does a blind man know what trees walking looks like? He's seeing in the spirit. In the spirit, you know, there's a lot of uh, language in, this, in, in biblical language about people looking like trees, being like trees, like planted by the rivers of water, planted by the Lord. And so he says, I see men like trees walking. And Jesus says, I don't want you to go back into that town. And the reason why is because that city was a city of blindness. They had so uh, become blind that, that that physical blindness was really a symptom of spiritual blindness that that man was experiencing. So for me, you know, getting in close proximity with others that can see and that do have eyes to see is a big deal and major part of impartation. Yeah, yeah, I love that, Jamie. One of the things I really felt like um, to talk about was the discerning of spirits. Um, I, I, something just hit me, and I feel like I feel like maybe if we can go through, and we'll start with Apostle Jane Hammond on this, but maybe two minutes each person, um, just to keep this rolling. But um, I, I think sometimes we see people that have this gifting, and they sometimes don't. Uh, they don't. They they maybe say things and with social media it's so easy just to put things out there but i think learning how to steward the discerning of spirits in your life for instance like i can see sometimes when people are talking to me if they're lying to me i sometimes i can see past that not all the time but usually i can hear actually the real conversation that's going on or or you know just things and, and most of the time probably 98 percent of the time i won't ever share that and i think people have to learn how to steward um if they have this gift which i believe that god's given it in great in this generation at a greater level um the discernment spirit so apostle jane i know you are very good at this gift you you have like a high i think it's your number one right a discerning of spirits so maybe you can encourage people on how to steward the discerning of spirits I, I, I like how you said you're good at this gift. I don't know if you ever get good at this <laughs> gift. Um, <laughs> but uh, discernment to me is, um, discerning spirits is you discern the spirit of God, first of all. Um, discern the move of God, discern the mood of God, discern, discerning God's intentions for, uh, for a season or for a gathering. Um, but of course we use this when talking about discerning angels, discerning devils, discerning the times. 
uh, discerning impure human motives where Paul said, beware of false brothers, okay? So uh, there is a dimension of discerning uh, the people that are around you and the motives that may be affecting their heart. So when I first started with this gift, I would say that I more discerned the negatives. I discerned um, the demons and I discerned the, the impure intentions of people. I have since expanded into understanding the rest of this gifting. Uh, but I can remember when uh, a young prophet came to America back in the uh, late 80s. His name was Kim Clement. And he called me out of a crowd of people and, and said that the Lord had anointed me to see the snake and to see the wolf. Uh, what a great prophecy. Um, and uh, we, we then came in in the next couple months to some, uh, some just challenging times in our ministry. And I can remember Bishop Hammond uh, coming to me and saying, you know, Jane, the Lord said that you have this gift, so I'm going to lay my hands on you. And I love what Jamie said, you know, the laying on of hands and getting around others. And so he laid his hands on me and he said, Lord, I activate that gift that's already in her to a place of fully functioning. And I want you to know it was literally like a curtain went up and all of a sudden the next day I went to church and all of a sudden I saw all this stuff on people. I heard their conversations. I saw the stuff they were doing. I saw, I heard, I, and I literally, after about two weeks of this, I went back to Bishop Hammond and I said, you put your hands back on me and take this gift back. I do not want this operating in my life. Get, I don't want this. And he told me that I would have to learn how to steward or manage the gift. And uh, it took me on a journey because for several years, I just wanted to kill everybody and tell God they died. Um, and, uh, and, and that was not very good as a pastor to do that. And my husband would constantly remind me, Jane, the Lord's showing you these things, not so you can judge people or be critical, but so that you can love them, so that we can set them free, so that we can bring them out of whatever bondage they're in into freedom and destiny. And yes, to identify sometimes when people are wolves. And so understanding demonic strategies, demonic strongholds, uh, operating through dreams, through visions, through different uh, means of discerning, but now understanding also that there's you know only one third of the angels fell so we should be seeing angels twice as much as we're seeing uh, demons and understanding that there are angel armies that are really mobilized during this season of time and understanding how to discern what's fully happening in the realm of the spirit uh, through this gift that I feel like if ever we were in a day that we need this gift operating it is today so that we can clearly see clearly perceive and clearly understand the thoughts and the intentions of God and how to strategize Ephesians 1 17 and 18 says may God give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him we don't just need revelation we need the wisdom or the strategy to go with the revelation so that we know how to properly pray and how to properly align ourselves with heaven yeah. And I love you've written a book called the Dis uh, discernment. So people would like to get that really to grow in that gift. And so, um, James Gall, you've written the discerner, um, and maybe share for two minutes, really like share on the discerning. Okay. So I also wrote releasing spiritual gifts today. And so a lot of my things, they all are kind of layered. So in my background, Derek Prince is the person who had the most impact on my life and spiritual development. So a systematic teacher. So I am both have the left systematic side and I have the right, then the intuitive revelatory. So it's the gift of discernings in plural and it's discernings of spirits in the plural. So Derek Prince taught that there were four different levels, different forms of spirits. There is discernings. The word discernings means to differentiate, to distinguish or perceive. The word seer is not used in the New Testament, but the word discernings is. I believe the gift of discernings of spirits is the complement to the Old Testament seer, and then you add that to the gift of prophecy, etc. Okay, so, but it is going to dis discern, distinguish, differentiate, perceive through many different, all the five senses. So, what? The human spirit. This is what Jesus did with Nathaniel. Behold, a man in whose spirit there is no guile. There was no, he was not a deceiver. So, it's the human spirit. It is then the angelic realms, 
It is the demonic realms, and it is the Holy Spirit himself. Tongues of fire distributed. This is how I move in Holy Spirit. I discern where the Holy Spirit intends to move, and then I follow that. Yeah. That is how John Wimber ministered. He ministered out of a corporate anointing and would sense, feel, know how the Holy Spirit was moving in a corporate dynamic. So for some, it's corporate. For some, it's individual. But just like what has been stated, it is a per divine perception, and it's going to be then special with each one of us. Some are going to have a specialty in discerning angels. Another is going to have a specialty in discerning the demonic. But it is available to discern all four realms. Kenneth Hagin added a fifth realm. He called it this, discerning the very similitude of God himself. I think that is stunning. Wow. Wow. I love that. Jennifer, even as you do, you actually, this is one of your courses you teach. Um, so you're, you have studied and studied on this. So Jennifer, Eva, share a little bit on your, uh, how God has taught you to steward it individually. Absolutely. Um, well, first of all, the way this broke open in my life, it was after I was delivered from a spirit of sorcery as a Christian. It was my, you know, I was a, a year into my Christianity, and then I was in a prayer a prayer group uh, with some people, and a lady stands up and she says, "I see a spirit of sorcery standing over you." And when she said that, something picks me up, throws me against the wall, and I go into a grand mall manifestation, which was very challenging for my church at the time because they didn't believe that if you have the Holy Spirit you can actually manifest on that dimension and I did of course it was related to the past stuff but I got delivered from that and giving you the short version I, I ultimately got delivered from that demon and then I found that when you get delivered from something the Holy Spirit will give you something and what he gave me was an ultra big anointing or the uh, you know discerning of spirits and so that was his that was his infusion as a result of that um, demonic departure and I didn't know I had it um, and all I knew is that all of a sudden, every time I was in crowds or I go to the mall or something like that, I was hearing, you know, the demons, I was hearing people's voices, you know, I was hearing their conversations, like many of you were saying, but it was overwhelming. I didn't know what to do with it. I found myself wanting to be alone as much as possible. Um, but over a period of time, and it was a long time because again, we didn't have the books, we didn't have the language, we didn't have the teaching. Um, I learned to work through it. I learned to manage it. Um, for those of you who have a very ultra strong gift discerning of spirits and you're like in the beginning stages of this well uh, uh being in the word and being in the prayer are going to be your lifesavers there's no getting around it because that's what stabilizes you so so prayer stabilizes me worship stabilized me uh the word stabilized me because i had to bring those gnarly emotions that weren't even mine i was actually discerning something and a lot of times at the time i didn't know what i was discerning but i knew it wasn't mine and so to stabilize it i would be in the word because i had to bring myself into congruency with the word of god the peace of god the love of god and all of that then it began to 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 emerge into ministry such as you know in prayer because i am a prayer person that's my core uh pray for nations i'm a prophetic intercessor intercessor to the nation so it worked in that realm and i would see the strategies of the enemy what does god want to do i discern the anointings of the lord and we just minister out of that when it came to people i didn't really like like jane said she said she really struggled with what she saw um my life was so broken i think some of that judgment got got broken off in the beginning because who was i to say you know stuff about people um so that was helpful um in in a sort of backward sort of way but so what happened is i learned to minister out of it okay this person's broken here i didn't assume they were a wolf or a sheep or a wolf in sheep's clothing you know if unless the lord showed me but i realized they were broken and my job as a pastor was to seed the word into them so that they can be free. And so that's how I stewarded it. I learned that my emotions are not always my emotions. I'll taste things, I'll, I'll smell things, I'll feel things. And I've learned a lot of times that uh, at this stage, uh, I'm in a good place with this, but at the beginning, it was not, it was not fun at all.
Yeah, yeah. And I love if you have, uh, Jennifer's doing a lot of mentoring and e-courses that you can get on and uh, get trained by her. Um, one of the things I feel like is very significant, and we're going to start closing the program, is um, I think James Gall has such a, after our last program, he talked about being a feeler. And I've watched, it's almost like after he said that something opened in me um, to really watch like so many people that are high feelers with what's going on in our nation and the nations of the world. I've watched people uh, tell them, hey, you have to be you have to learn how to manage your feelings in the in the midst of what's going on, because I, I feel like the people that are high feelers are the ones that are going through more. I shouldn't say more satanic attack, but they're learning how to manage that. I'm talking about the next generation. And so with that, I think there's something on James. I'm just telling you there's something so powerful on your um, teaching on feelers right now in this season for the next generation, the prophets, because there's um, like even Jennifer was saying, like when you go into regions, like when I had started going into like places and I would feel what was going on in a region, you have to make sure you don't take that on as your life like the enemy tries to do that as a feeler and so you have to learn how to discern how to uh manage all of that and i i know jane's really great at that when she travels and god gives her words for regions and that and so what we want to do is this last part we want to start talking about um uh, what's going on in America and how is a seer? How do you steward your gift in the middle of all this download? Because I'm sure people are having such an increase of downloads. Um, actually, let's start with uh, maybe Jamie Galloway on this one. And so uh, Jamie, maybe to help and encourage people on how to steward as a seer all the downloads and you can add in the feeler part of it. How, to, how are you doing it as a seer? Yeah, you know, Proverbs 25.2 is probably one of my favorite verses in regard to mysteries and revelation. You know, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search a matter out. When God begins to show something to you, it's our part and our partnership with him that we actually go on an amazing journey of discovery, really understanding everything that it is that he's trying to convey to us. And so, you know, it's easy for me or anybody else to kind of, um, you know, in this day and age, you know, just live off, you know, you want something new constantly. But I am personally chewing on things that are months old right now. And, I, and, and you know, things that I've, I've experienced in my spirit, things that I know in my spirit that are, that are happening. So, for instance, the beginning of this season, I had a dream, very significant dream, and it was about the thief and the robber. And I had, I had several dreams about thieves and robbers coming in the middle of the night. And the Lord started sharing with me that there were multiple thieves and robbers and that ultimately he was coming as the thief in the night. And so we needed to be prepared for him, for his coming. Like the 10 virgins, you know, the five wise and five were foolish. The five wise got oil in their lamps and they were ready for him like he was coming like a thief in the night. However, there is also the other side, which is the thief and the robber, the enemy. And in the dream, I was shown that we need to be on guard because the thief and the robber are coming. And we actually need to hold them in the dream. I held them until the proper authority showed up, which is a sign to me that God is emerging new realms or new levels of authority. Now, my process looks like I got that revelation, but I'm going to unpack it until I maximize its full potential in my life. And so if you're seeing something right now, guys, you know, you're hearing echoes of it and other people, other people are saying the same thing. Maximize your revelation, get in the word, try to discover where other people are hearing the same thing. And that's powerful. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And so uh, let's jump over to James. James on that, uh, share a little bit on how uh, maybe you can encourage people or Sears are getting downloads right now on how to steward that with what's going on in America. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I'm going to unpack something, have to do it quickly, I know. But I've been given a whole series of dreams and things in this realm about the thief and the robber. So it's fascinating that Jamie mentions this. Uh, it was a year ago, uh, this coming August, I was in Washington, D.C., and I was given vivid uh, revelation about a security breach that had occurred in the United States. I was told what city it happened in, and then these two dark entities appeared before me. And I had to, in the spirit, though, though I was asleep, 
Your spirit does not sleep or slumber, and neither does God's spirit in you. So I addressed the dark entities, and I commanded them in the name of Jesus, tell me what is your name? And they said, my name is Thief. And the other one said, my name is Robber. That helped give a picture frame to me to what in part was happening in this nation. The thief and the robber, and it gets governmental. It's trying to steal our inheritance. Yeah. And I was taken to major historic cities of the founding of this nation to try to steal, rob the foundation of this nation. Then in March, I was given one of the most dramatic visitations that I've had in probably 30 years, where I had a dream where a manual called the Global Dragon Warfare Manual appear before me. It opened up, I could read the table of contents. I read the titles of the 12 stages. It's quite complex. I did an hour interview with Sid Roth uh, about this with over a million viewers on this. And in it, then I saw the uh, the seventh stage was global pandemic. The uh, sixth stage was the, um, the scourge of fear. And the eighth stage of what the enemy wants to do is global economic collapse. But I believe that I was shown that so that this does not happen. It's thus far no more. And I submitted this to Cindy Jacobs, the Apostolic Council of Prophetic Elders, of which Jane is a part of. And we are standing together that this global dragon warfare will activity will not occur. So we come into agreement mm -hmm. with God's plan we bind the enemy's plan, and then we release the opposite spirit. So we call forth reset, recalibration, recover, and restoration in Jesus' name. So always do this. Ask God for the opposite spirit and release that. That is a weapon of spiritual warfare. That's so good, James. Uh, there's so much weight on what you just shared. Wow. Brian Gurren, how would you encourage people that are having these major downloads, you know, what's going on? How would you encourage them in this season? Yeah, uh, great question. I would say um, probably a little bit more practical to hopefully help people that at least some steps I try to take is number one, keeping that which is before you clean and pure. You know, because often I've just seen a lot where us as seers, you know, if it, it can get blurry if you start to allow that filter to take in things that, you know, often liken it to focusing on the news line and newsreel of heaven, trying to stay focused on what the Lord's saying. Because often I notice your soul can start to overlap and even the way you interpret, like Proverbs 22, 2 that Jamie said, can get skewed. And I've seen that often. And uh, so I'd encourage people practically look to Jesus. I love the Matthew 25. Uh, bridesmaids that Jamie talked on as well um, to stay pure before the Lord, stay in the word, fall madly in love with Jesus in this hour. I have seen his voice, his tone change, to be honest with you. It actually happened in December and I didn't know really what we were stepping into, but his voice has changed. Still loving, compassionate, merciful, true, but I could tell his tone through various encounters and experiences really kind of amped up to a, a more stern gear, you know, and I think he's wanting the church to wake up um, not be lax in this hour, but I would say practically to see and interpret clearly, then keep what you're taking in pure and clean as best as you can. You know, a lot of times the noise can start to blur that. And I've seen vessels get skewed and get caught off in other currents that aren't purely from the spirit and then project, which really isn't, it's 10% the spirit. The other 90 is actually voices of, of the soul and, and it can get polluted that way. So I encourage people in, in that manner, if that helps.
Yeah, that's so good you share that. I was thinking about at the beginning of this year, I, I had this vision and I saw God stand up, right? And anytime I see the Lord, I never see his face. It's just usually him. And I saw, and I actually started researching and calling friends. So if you're watching online and God gives you something kind of big and you're like, I'm not going to release that, but you can go and ask different people that are different seers or different prophets and at, submit what you see to them and ask them, hey, what do you think of that? And so when I saw God stand up, I started started to look through the Bible to, like you were saying, Brian, look through the Bible and find where that would line up. What, what did God, when God stood up in the Bible, what does that mean? And then I actually called people, my friends that I trust. And I said, uh, you know, God showed me, I saw God standing up. What does that mean? And so to even process through some big things you see in the season is really good to have other people around you doing that. So Jennifer Ibez, I I think we have to unmute Jennifer. So gotcha. Um, so so powerful what what all of you are saying. And one of the um, again going back to discerning spirits and me being a prophetic intercessor, I discerned that what the tactic of the enemy was to grab hold of the mouth of the Christian and begin to get Christians to speak uh, what what the enemy is saying rather than what God is saying. Uh, you know, and and so I've been encouraging people: don't be a pulpit of the enemy. Don't be a pulpit for Satan. We want to be a pulpit for God. Uh, just because you see that doesn't mean you have to say it. You don't have to say everything you see, and to always remember the processing pieces of it. Um, you know, and and so. Uh, I didn't have the, 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 the amazing um, journey that James had. All I had was one word that we're coming out more prosperous than before. You know, that was, that was the word of the Lord. Uh, you know, the counter attack to the global, you know, economic fallout that, that Satan intends. And so, so with that, um, you know, we, we do want to take note that there is an instruction that many of us have heard that prophetic words, whatever you say, have to edify, exhort, and encourage. That's only one side of the instruction. There are some other instructions in the Bible about prophetic words. Um, you know, so, so, you know, some are to warn. But I noticed when there was warnings in the New Testament, they, they would be very focused into certain crowds. You know, they, they wouldn't, we didn't have, they didn't have social media, so they couldn't blast it all over the place. You know, Agabus st stood up and he warned the Christians in Antioch uh, or in Jerusalem, I'm sorry. Um, you know, Paul warned the, the people on the ship and it was very focused and, and it was done well. And there was, there was, they got the very best outcome. And I think we're not thinking of outcomes when we, when we say, when we say, you know, those horrible things that we truly are downloading, some of us, um, and we're, we're not thinking about outcomes. We're not thinking about, okay, what's the fruit of this word if I say it this way? And so I want to encourage people to do some process, do some processing. Like you said, go talk to some people. Okay, but what is God saying? How do I take what I just discern? What, what, where, where do I put this? Do I put it out? Do I keep it behind and put it to the intercessor group? Let's, let's, let's really fix on the process before we just shoot out everything that comes our way. Yeah, I love that. And if you're watching online and uh, you're learning how to process through releasing words and social media, you can go to our YouTube, my YouTube channel, and you can actually watch one we call uh, Profits and Social Media and all of that. It is really such a powerful thing. We had different Lana Vosser, we had Patricia King, we all talked about like how to release words on social media. So Jane Hammond, let's talk about, um, maybe you wanted to share a little bit about what God's showing you for America in this time. And like, maybe you can uh, share that and also encourage people how to, how to release and work through being a seer in this season. Um, so I think that it's important to understand that uh, God has a destiny and a purpose for every single nation, uh, but that what we're actually dealing with right, right now has global implications. A year and a half ago when I was in South Korea, I had uh, two visions. I had a vision of the angel armies over that area and what God was getting ready to do in bringing a breaking open of awakening and revival. And I can't, I don't have time to go into all of that. But the second one that I saw was um, I had a very, very detailed vision of a seven headed, the seven headed dragon being off of what James said, the seven headed dragon of the book of revelation. And I saw that, that as each nation was praying over their particular issue that represented one of the heads of the dragon, that the head would come off the dragon as intercessors would pray. 
and then they would go on to battling something else. And while they were doing that, the head they just cut off would grow back. And I felt like the Lord said, it's going to take a global focus of prayer where I put the world in a state where everybody's praying at once. And, and when that happened, I saw the sword of the Lord come and just take all seven heads off the dragon. And then so that the heads couldn't come back. I know this is deep, but so then so the heads couldn't come back. I saw the Lord take a lance and drive it straight through the heart of this dragon. And afterwards, there came the mass, the most massive revival awakening that the earth has ever seen. Sweeping harvest, sweeping revival, sweeping awakening, uh, unlike anything that we've ever seen. And what was interesting is when I shared this on the call with the uh, Apostolic Prophetic Council of Elders, uh, Becca Greenwood said that she works with intercessors in China. And, and years ago, they identified, and I had no idea about this, but they identified the heart of the dragon as being located in Wuhan, China. Prior to like this year, I'd never even heard of Wuhan, China, but I saw God drive a lance through the heart of this dragon and she, they identified as being in Wuhan and then massive revival. And so I think that in America, we've got to stand our ground. I mean, we have so much that's been given to us and much is going to be required of us. I saw at the beginning of the year, the Lord putting a white stone into the hands of believers. And I saw him putting a white stone into the hand of the president, the president's family and the president's uh, close advisors. And uh, it was the white stone of the overcomers. I don't have time to go into that, but the white stone actually indicated um, was given to juries to uh, cast verdicts. Um, and, and innocent or guilty. It was given in elections to cast yes or no. Um, and it was given to victors and to overcomers. And I saw Jesus literally putting these white stones into our hands and into the hands of the president on those three things. And, you know, at that point, when I had the vision, it felt like just warm and fuzzy affirmation from Jesus. But what I didn't do is I didn't understand what Jesus was doing was he was prophesying to us. He was saying, listen, this is going to be a year like no other, and there's going to be a lot of things that you're going to have to overcome this year, and I want you to know that I'm putting a white stone to say, listen, I have cast a verdict for you already, That I and I'm voting for you, I'm standing for you, and if you align my, with my understanding of my word and what I've prophesied over this nation, you're going to understand that I've called you to be an overcomer, but overcomers only become overcomers when they overcome. And so there's going to be a lot that we're going to have to overcome. I believe God's calling the church to wake up, open up our eyes, see what we need to see. This is not just for seer prophets. This is not just for senior seer prophets. This is not just for intercessors. This is for every single believer in America. I had an angelic encounter years ago where an angel woke me up uh, with a loud voice that said, wake up. And, uh, and I said to the Lord, wow, I thought I was awake. He sent an angel down to wake me up. And I said, wow, I thought I was awake. And he said, most of my church thinks that they're awake, but they're still asleep. He said, you need to wake up so that you can wake them up. I'm telling you, as much chaos as there is right now, which I have to say I had a dream last week, is really being fueled by a lot of occult. I saw uh, in a dream, I saw bonfires that are being fueled by occult uh, uh, hexes and vexes and curses and sacrifices. And I saw the bonfires raging. And I, and I said that this is the, the, that the rage that you're seeing in cities is being fueled by uh, occultic curses and occultic activity. And the next day in prayer, I, I kept seeing that bonfire and that rage that was building in our nation. And then what I saw happen is I saw the people of God beginning to release the language of the Holy Spirit, the river of God out of the midst of us. And the river came and doused the, the fires of the enemy and doused the flames that the enemy uh, is trying to build in the cities. Why did the heathen rage and the nation and the people plot a, a vain thing? We're dealing with some very strong spiritual forces right now. And that's why I really believe that even having this seer opportunity right now is to call the entire body of Christ into a place of seeing, of hearing, of engaging. God's not just showing you things so that you can know them. He's showing you things so that we can strategize, so that we can pray, so that we can pull heaven down into the earth realm, and so that we can see breakthrough come, because God is not done with the United States of America. As a matter of fact, other visions and visionaries have seen angels unrolling scrolls declaring, America shall be saved. And I believe with all my heart in what Jennifer said, I believe that the 
the Lord said this is going to be a comeback. We're going to see financial comeback. We're going to see spiritual comeback. We're going to see spiritual momentum unlike anything we've ever seen before. The harvest fields are ripe, but let me just say, I've never once seen har a, a cornfield jump out of a field and into a truck to be harvested. you got to send harvesters out to get the harvest. So I believe it's time that God's breaking this open. doesn't matter what background you're from, what denomination you're from, what upbringing you're from. God is saying, I'm opening up your eyes to see. I'm opening up your ears to hear, and I'm putting a sickle in your hands so that you can go out and be part of one of the greatest harvests that's ever happened on planet Earth. The harvesters are coming, and I believe that that's what God is saying to us for this season of time. Wow, I feel that. Do you mind praying right now as we start to, we're closing down now? Yeah. Pray for America. We'll all agree with you. Father, I thank you right now, God, that there is going to be such an outpouring of your spirit that out of our innermost being will flow rivers of living water and that that capacity in the spirit will douse these flames of fire that the enemy is trying to build to, to, to advance the Antichrist agenda and to advance the agenda of anarchy. Lord, we thank you, Father God, that you, your throne is above the throne of the enemy and Lord, that that spirit that has come to try to, to, to bring division in the nation. God is only preparing the way. God, you're going to turn chaos and confusion into comeback. And Lord, one of the definitions of the word comeback is the word revival. So we thank you, Father God, that you're opening up our capacity to see and hear in the spirit so that we know exactly what you're doing, God. Lord, that we're not caught up in what the enemy's doing. We know exactly what you're doing because, God, you're turning this all around. You're turning the curse to a blessing for us, God, because you love us. So let us see, God, your heart, your mind, your will, your your intention, Father. Let us see the activity of your angel army throughout our nation and throughout the nations of the world, God, because this is going to be the church's greatest hour. We decree it in Jesus' name. Oh, wow. That's so powerful. And so um, thank you guys so much for joining us for Seer 2.0. Um, please go, man, I feel the spirit of the Lord. Um, Please go to their websites and you can download things, uh, buy their books, uh, go on Amazon, buy their books, be part of, Jennifer has a mentorship, James is doing so many e-courses, Jane has a lot of product out there. Can I mention something real quick? Sure. Um, sure. We, we actually have August 22nd, we have our, our next 90-day school, The Prophets, uh, that's coming up. And so whether they want to come here to Florida or if they want to participate online, it's a 90-day intensive for the prophetic, um, for, for seer prophets, for Nabi prophets, uh, for prophets to the nations. Uh, it's a 90-day intensive training. And so if you want more information on that, text the word prophet, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, to the number 55444. That's the number prophet the name, the word profit to 55444. Four, 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 and it'll give you some instructions about how you can join us for this incredible, incredible piece of training that I think will launch you to a whole new level in hearing and seeing the voice of the Lord. Yeah. And I just want to say to, to push that also, there's something about being on this campus that they've opened. There's a portal of the prophetic here that they've stewarded for decades here that really like, even when I'm here, I get such downloads at a different level. Um, so, you know, just being part of something like that's so important. And so also you can go to their school, of the prophets, their website. Also, uh, if you're not tech savvy on your phone, you can go to the website and get that. Um, but, thank you guys so much for joining us um like i said they have all these books that are out there to really equip you um for that this is a season of the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry it's going to be all hands on deck all the saints are are being activated to do the work of the ministry and so um please 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 and if we could just give um does anybody have any last minute things they'd like to say we're good. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us for Steer 2.0 and we'll see you next time.